fun. We're ready for another club webinar. We're at 64. This is where we answer your questions, the questions that come into the club from the club members, do a little research. Uh, sometimes it's more complex questions. Sometimes it's basic stuff. But again, we look at the list and see what kind of like tally it up. What's the most questions this week? We have a student webinar on another night of the week and we have a CCO live webinar. If you want to know more about the webinars, I'll tell you about them here in just a second. Now, please forgive me as I have moved my camera around and, and new monitor, new computer, and things are a little different for me. Tonight, we're going to be talking about medical coding tips on the operative report. A lot of questions recently came in regarding that, how to read an opera report. How do I know what I need to know and not need to know? And some of these opera reports can be several pages long, depending on what's you know being done. And very seldom are you going to get, excuse me, an opera report that is only one page long. So what I did was I divided it up. We've got an example, but I want to give you some tips that you can practice. Uh, also in the reference page, there are some links where you can go out and look at some op reports. Some of the best places to get op reports is transcription uh, sites, people learning to do transcription, but also for medical schools. And I would look into specialty medical schools. So I was doing some research in urology today and found some great uh, op reports in there that I could use, but that I, I didn't, I didn't use one for tonight. Quite honestly, they were just way too long. So tonight, that's what we're going to talk about. But now, I wanted to tell you for anybody that's new joining us, if this is your first time, we have a fabulous club that you can join. It's cco.us forward slash club. Advantages to being a member of the club is that you get to see these webinars plus the transcription that we have done and you get to keep the slide decks that you're going to to see. And tonight would be a one that I would want to keep the slide deck, have that at your fingertips. You don't, uh, you can also ask questions about the recordings and what you've learned or share information that's applicable to other people that you think will be beneficial all through the club. You also get to uh, see all of the other recordings that we've done, all the other webinars through the years. And then uh, it's not just about coding. We have billing, we have auditing, we have risk adjustment, we have compliance, we have pathophysiology and pharmacology. That's just to name a few, inpatient, outpatient, extended product support, and you get support from uh, subject matter experts, you get the regular staff like myself and your instructors and your coaches. Uh, we have interns and other students that all chime in and have uh, that allows us to have this great support group in our club. So again, that is cco.us forward slash club. So now we're ready to talk about the opera boards. The first thing that I think is going to be beneficial to you when you look at an op report is how it's divided up. Now, I found at this particular website that was for educating providers, what's the minimum that you need for a progress op report? And Ultimately, what that means is you go in, you do the procedure. As soon as the procedure's over, then you write out this op report. Now, this is not the op report that's going to be billed. Okay, it's not completed, but it's the minimum information that they have to have documented right after the procedure. And it's so it's not the official op report. They'll go back, they'll transcribe that, right? They'll dictate and have that transcribed, and then they'll sign off on that. However, minimal information. You think, well, why do I need to know what, you know, to 
to look at in a minimum progress note because it highlights the important information that you are going to abstract from a full progress note. Now, I didn't pull out a copy of these. We are just highlighting bullet points, so to speak. And so I made this graph and let's talk about the first thing. They're required to put the surgeon's name, if there's an assistant, if there's an anesthesiologist, any of the providers that are taking a part in the procedure needs to be listed. So not only are they listed, but their credentials are listed. We need to know if uh, the assisting surgeon is an intern. Are they a resident, right? Uh, and uh, maybe they're nurse practitioners, maybe they're PAs. Okay, so all of that has to be listed, as well as the anesthesiologist. And that's important to know because if there is an op uh, being done and there's an anesthesiologist or a CRNA, then you know that they're probably getting general anesthesia. Okay, so that's important to know. Now, a lot of people are concerned when they first start doing op reports and it'll say general anesthesia and they have they they feel like they need to go and pull an anesthesia code from a CT a CPT manual but that's not actually what's done because within the op report itself the type of anesthesia that is listed the provider for the anesthesia is listed and um, they will do their own report, an anesthesia report, and that'll get billed separately, okay? So know that the information that's in the op report itself, that's all included, okay? We just need to know who all's there. So you don't have to code the anesthesia on the op report because that'll be coded by either the anesthesiology coder or separately for inpatient. Okay, so uh, again, don't be looking for an thinking that you have to find an anesthesia code for that. All right, next thing that is pertinent is we need to know what procedure was actually performed and if more than one procedure was performed. Sometimes they'll go in thinking that they're going to do a procedure one way and they end up doing it another way. So an example of that would be someone that goes in to have a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, they're going to take out their gallbladder and there's a complication and they're not able to do the procedure laparoscopically so they have to go ahead and open them up and take the gallbladder out like that. It ended up almost happening when I had my gallbladder out many years ago. I was 38, that's a little ding ding to uh, my birthday, right? <laughs> Since it's my birthday today. I may find a lot of ways to say that. And I'm sure the transcriptionists that work on this uh, and put it into the club will be tickled about that. Anyway, don't wanna digress. So they went in laparoscopically to take out my gallbladder, but my cholecystectomy was done in an acute setting because I was fine and all of a sudden, bam, I had this horrible attack. Never had any signs and symptoms ever before. And so they checked it. They thought that's what it was. They sent me home. The next, uh, it wasn't even 12 hours later, I thought I was dying. And so went back to the ER and of course it was the weekend. So they kept me drugged up in the hospital and then Monday morning, first, thing I was taken in to have my gallbladder removed and he told me he said we'll just do this laparoscopically and he said very seldom do we have to change it to an open procedure but he said I won't delay in doing that I'll do it if I have to um, and he's like okay great so when I wake up and he comes back and checks on me and he said yeah we did it laparoscopically but he said I almost had to open you up he said your gallbladder was so slimy and deteriorated that and I didn't have an infection per se it was deteriorating I guess he said it was almost shredded and he said that 
he kept trying to get it out and they what they ultimately do and i urge you to go look at these uh ops you can go to youtube and see the procedure being done but they end up putting it in like a little bag while it's inside of you and then they pull it out through this little hole they make and he said and i couldn't get it picked up and put it in the bag and he goes i just every time i'd pick it up it would fall and uh he said so he said i was going to try one more time and then i was going to open you up because i didn't want to keep delaying the procedure and you don't want to be under anesthesia longer than you have to be and he said and i got it so in that situation we would have gone from a laparoscopic procedure to an open procedure what happens if you go in and they're doing a cholecystectomy and then they see a mass right and they end up removing something else for it to be biopsied or pathology to be done. Again, now you're listing more than one procedure and that happens sometimes. May uh, I remember one of the providers at the hospital that I worked at and because you know he never had any complications it seemed like ever and um, it was an unusual situation that when he went to do this procedure, the trocar, something happened in the trocar which is this little pointy thing they stick in you to lift organs out of the way and it went through and lacerated the patient's liver and again it was a you know an accident a freak thing however then they had to go in and take care of that but that's not why the procedure was the original procedure so multiple procedures were being done you never know what's going to happen or they go in thinking they're going to do something and then they have a complication like excessive bleeding or a more extended or complicated uh, procedure than what they thought that they were going to have to do. So all of that has to be listed and it's a minimum you want, you know, they're going to list out everything that was done, what was intended and what was actually done. And we'll talk about that again in just a minute. The findings, what did we find when we got in there to do the job? So they're doing a cholecystectomy on, on me when they got in there, he mentioned that the the gallbladder was, there was no stones in my gallbladder. However, it was uh, deteriorating. He said it wasn't rotting, you know, it wasn't infected. He said, but it was very inflamed and, and the integrity of the, the organ itself was deteriorating. So again, that's the findings that, that they get and then they'll also whenever they go in and look they, they kind of do an overall look because they're already in there just to make sure uh, air, they fill your abdomen with air and then kind of view and and I think they noted that I had a fatty liver because of course you have to kind of lift the liver up out of the way to get to the gallbladder so that's a finding that you would list estimated blood loss You'll see that on every op report that's ever done. Estimated blood loss. This is not really pertinent to you as it, unless it is part of a complication. If there's a hemorrhage or something, then that backs that up. But it's a minimum that they have to put, so know that it'll be there. But if there's any specimens removed, so again, if you're gonna take out the gallbladder, then again, it would be taken out. What if, they removed um, uh, the bile duct. Sometimes part of the bile duct will be removed with the gallbladder or before it's clipped off because there's stones involved or, or it's infected. Anything that's removed uh, for pathology or uh, uh, for like a cancerous tumor, whatever, that would be listed. And also a post-operative diagnosis. So my post-operative diagnosis for my gallbladder was cholecystitis, right, an inflamed gallbladder ultimately, and I had no stones, so that was not listed. And then of course fatty liver would have been listed because that's a diagnosis that attributes to my health and also attributes to possible complication in an op because your liver is solid, but if you've ever picked up a beef liver, you know, like you get in the store that you're going to fry, have liver 
and onions or something, you know, if you've ever picked that up, you can just barely touch it and it, it will fall apart in your hands. You can pinch it, you know, you can, you don't, you have to use a knife to cut it or anything. So again, that's the consistency of our liver. When you go in and you lift that up, if it's fatty, it makes it even more, um, it, it makes it even easier to deteriorate it because there's actually fat in there. Uh, it's not as solid. Don't forget, I mentioned it at the beginning, this is the minimum information for an op report progress note. Okay, This isn't the official report. More information is going to be included before it's coded and billed and sent off. However, if you're working inpatient or outpatient procedures and stuff, you're probably going through these and you may be getting them ready to be billed. So you're pulling these codes, but there will be other information that will be on the official op report. Now we're going to look at that. The elements for your op report are going to be uh, a lot more extensive. So depending on what you're coding from. I come from a risk adjustment background, which you hear me talk about all the time. And a, a risk adjustment coder is going to look at the documentation in an op report with a different set of eyes than the eyes of the coder who's actually getting reimbursement for the procedure that's done. Because a risk adjustment coder is looking to see what the diagnosis was so that they can capture HCCs. And a coder that is, uh, you know, like an inpatient coder or a pro fee coder is looking uh, at what's done to the patient so that they can get reimbursed, use the CPT codes or the ICD-10 PCS codes for reimbursement. So again, Everything that you're seeing here in this table is going to tell you what has to be on the op report before it's sent off and billed. And we're going to talk about what's in each one of these so that you know what to abstract, what to look for. So that's going to be your next tip. Very first thing. Now, if you're looking at it from, it doesn't matter if you're doing it from a risk adjustment standpoint or a um, uh, I'm going to call it regular coder, okay? So don't, just because it's not a specialty. From a risk adjustment standpoint, there's different things that uh, allow the document to be uh, valued before you can send it off. Like it has to be legible. You have to have base, you know, certain things like the data service name, um, all this other stuff, but it also has to have a, sig a, a correct uh, signature, so on and so forth. That also happens with the, the regular coder that's coding for reimbursement. Everything wants to be there, but they may be looking at a draft, right, before the official signature and prepping and coding, whereas a risk adjustment coder would never do that because you're looking at retrospective stuff. Um, but the first thing is the name of the patient. We need to know the date of the service the date of birth for the patient, the medical record number, and then you might also have uh, some other information, not necessarily address, usually it could be on there, it just depends what type of an EMR, but that's the patient's basic demographics. You wanna make sure that you've got the right patient for the right date of service for the right procedure. It's important because you could have a patient that's having multiple procedures done in a day or a patient that's having uh, procedures back to back from one day to the next. And again, you have to be able to match right patient, right data service uh, for the procedure and the correct procedure that's being done. You can also do this not only with the data service, but with the providers. So let's say a patient has uh, chest pain and they end up uh, deciding that they're going to do interventional radiology and they, they start interventional radiology. They go in and they scope them and they're doing like an angioplasty. They get in there and they realize, no, we really need to do bypass. Well, a, a different surgeon would do the bypass. 
okay, probably than the interventional radiologist. It's kind of two different departments. So you have interventional radiology as part of cardiology, and then you have a cardiology surgeon. So to, it, it would be the same patient, same date of service, two different procedures, two different providers for the documentation. So make sure that you have that information. Also, like we mentioned before, on the minimum information, you're going to have your surgeon, or whoever, uh, if there was a surgeon involved, there are some procedures where uh, the the provider isn't a surgeon. However, you know it depends what what your uh, uh, it might be an op report for uh, debriding of some type of a wound, and they just do it right there uh, in the uh, in the office or something. So uh, we talked about. All the providers that were involved, including the anesthesiologist, if he was the only part he or she was the only provider, et cetera, et cetera. All of that has to be on there. And it's going to be pertinent because uh, the anesthesiologist does their own report. But let's say we have two procedures going on at one time. Uh, let's say we have something where we have a patient coming in for a cancer. They uh, the oncology surgeon or the general surgeon is going to remove the mass, but to get in there and do that, they had to make a, a significant wound. And then you have a, another surgeon that comes in that's like a reconstruction specialist. So they would be working at the same time. So this, you know, surgeon A is removing the mass, but surgeon two is harvesting one part of the body, maybe on the thigh, and they take the skin from that, and then they're going to create a flap uh, to to cover up or uh, fix the wound that the other surgeon created. So they're side by side, two surgeons, and they would do two op reports and talk about each other uh, component of that. So two different surgeons, same patient, same day, same time, same anesthesiologist, et cetera, et cetera. So be very cognizant of that when you're looking through the chart and you're coding that. What anesthesia type is always mentioned on every single one. General anesthesia is what it's usually going to say. And then the anesthesiologist will do their own report that will have even more information about the type of anesthesia medication that was given when it's time started and stopped and so on and so forth. If you want more information about carding at uh, coding anesthesia, then we've done a lot of training on that and uh, you can go into the club and pull those. So the anesthesia type, on all op reports, you're going to have a pre-op diagnosis and a post-op diagnosis. What did we think we were going to do in this procedure? You know, why did we have them scheduled? What was the plan? And then after it's all done, what did we actually do and find? Okay, so what's the pre-op and post-op diagnosis, pre-op and post-op procedures as well, but the diagnosis. We went in and we thought that the patient had, um, you know, a uh, pain in the abdomen due to, uh, you know, stones, gallbladder stones, but when they got in there, then they found this mass or something. Okay, so that's on every single op report pre-op and post-op diagnosis, and the procedures as well that was done if more than one procedure was done. And that's usually always listed at the top. Now, when you're coding, do not code from the pre-op di diagnosis or the pre-op procedure, the procedures being done. Make sure you code from the post-op diagnosis. Now, sometimes they're the exact same thing. They'll just be duplicated, and they're always usually listed one and then the other. But sometimes a different different diagnosis is found, right? Maybe they thought it was a cyst, but when they got in there, they realized it wasn't a cyst. It was a mass or it was a lymphoma or a li uh, lipoma, you know, something like that. So pre-op and post-op uh, diagnosis could be different, always usually at the top. What were the indications for the procedure being done. All right, so when I went and had my cholecystectomy, it was acute pain for mine. Uh, and then uh, 
they probably had put cholecystitis and, and explained, you know, how old I was, uh, what were the indications what, that I'd come into the ER. They'd done an ultrasound. They'd done other exams and that everything came out negative. Uh, you know, my labs, all that pertinent stuff that says, hey, what, it's kind of like the HPI for an op report. You know, what, what's the history of the pe present illness for this particular procedure. And it usually starts out, you know, uh, this is a age uh, female, blah, 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 and then a little scenario. Uh, if there was like an accident or a trauma, maybe it would say, you know, you've got a 21-year-old uh, motor vehicle accident, uh, uh, you know, amputation of um, left foot, blah, 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 you know, traumatic amputation or whatever. There's a little scenario that's there and that's what the indications are. Why are we doing the procedure that the patient's here to do? And then it's kind of the body of the, the op report, the procedure itself. There's a lot of technical stuff, a lot of verbiage. The only way you're going to get good at the verbiage of these is to read lots of op reports. And in the beginning, I mentioned transcription sites, excellent way to, to uh, get practice, as well as uh, uh, now scribes, a lot of scribes, they'll have practices, not a whole lot of op reports, but again, they, they do that too. Um, and in addition, I would uh, look at medical school training, you know, and not just uh, start looking at specialties. So general practitioner, you're probably not going to find any money, uh, but go out and look at cardiology uh, specialists, go to the, I was looking at urology today, uh, uh, chiropractic medicine, you know, just all kinds of things now, chiropractics, uh, they do procedures, but not necessarily ops, right? But they do manipulation. But the documentation, as much documentation as you can get your hands on to practice reading, that'll be good. Another thing that I think is very advantageous, in, depending on what your tolerance is for blood and guts, uh, get out there on YouTube or go to sites like OR Live. It's or.liv.com, I think. And you can, they give you a whole list of all these procedures that are being done from robotic procedures to Mohs surgery to cholecystectomies, hysterectomies. Uh, and then they are educational videos, training videos on how the procedure is being done. And then the provider, the surgeon is talking you through the process while you're viewing it. And they're explaining why they're doing what they do et cetera, et cetera. So the verbiage that you're hearing as they're doing it is exactly what you'll be reading when you document. It's very similar. So again, that's another way to increase your skill set at verbiage. Why do you want to do that? Besides the most basic reasons that we could explain easily is that you need to know what's fodder and what's not. What, what do I need to know? You know, we don't care what, how the patient is prepped for the procedure, that they're put in the, uh, you know, trend, uh, some type of, uh, what was it, trend Dillenberg or whatever, I don't even remember what they're called now, uh, but, you know, whether they have them head up uh, or head down, et cetera, et cetera. We, we don't care. We don't care where the IV site is at. Uh, we don't care. Um, about any of the basic stuff about how the the patient's draped for surgery or uh, even their statistics, their, their vital signs and all this, stuff, which is more of an anesthesia thing. We don't care. That's not part of what we're going to code for. So what's fodder and what's not? Now, they have to write all of this because they have to explain everything they're doing. And op reports are much, well, I don't know that they're more detailed than they used to be, but a lot of this stuff is done for malpractice too, you know, you because if you didn't put it in there, it wasn't done, right? Um, so uh, the procedure itself is the bulk, it's the body of the report itself. 
complications. That's usually at the end, but if you're reading through and you see that there's a problem that, you know, they wanted to take this particular vessel, but they couldn't, and so they ended up with, you know, plan B, and they ended up having to harvest a different vessel, so on and so forth, or they had hemorrhaging, all of that will be in the body, but they also kind of sum up complications at the end as well, often, if there's major complications, or they'll state there was no complications, and I've got an example of that. Most of the time, you know, that's what you see there was no complications, patient tolerated the procedure well, blah, blah, blah. If there was any specimens or pathology, we need to know that because what was removed from the body? Was it an ectomy of some kind, right? Did they remove something? Is there going to be a path report that comes in after that, that, that will change the diagnosis if we have a, a tumor removed that looks suspicious and the provide, the surgeon puts, you know, pars, uh, possible, uh, you know, carcinoma, but until the path comes back, we don't actually know, right, until they look at the gross examination of the, the tissue and the cells themselves. So again, that would pay, that would make a difference in what we're coding for diagnosis especially. A description of the op, kind of a overview real quick, okay, this is what we did, right, and then the signatures at the end. And we want to make sure they're properly e-signed and, uh, uh, you know, whatever protocol is there for your facility or whoever you're coding for. Another thing that's going to help you get really good at this is to know your anatomy. Now, some of this verbiage is, you know, it cr crosses over verbiage, but think about the, the cholecystectomy. Here is a look at the gallbladder right? But look at where the liver is, and the uh, you're also going to hear about the bile duct that is attached to it, uh, the portal vein, and the, the and so on and so forth. You'll be hearing about different things like the hepatic artery was uh, moved uh, over so that the, you know, blah, blah, blah. And if you know this anatomy, then you know that, uh, Whenever there's a complication, you also know what information's fodder. What do I not need to know? Plus, some of this is detailed in your CPT codes and your PCS codes, uh, as far as uh, descriptions. So the you know this particular artery was dissected and an osmosis was done. Blah blah blah. You know, and so again, that may change what the the code by just a few verb uh, words, so not just the verbiage of the anatomy, which again, that's really, really important. You need to know the anatomy, but also all of the names for the different procedures and the instruments that are used. So you would never want to not know what a trocar was, put it that way, things like that. This is a fabulous, uh, picture that we're now getting off find a code uh, they are letting us use that and so we're going to see more of these in the future uh, find a code has now making their own graphics so that's kind of cool so we're going to talk about an example now of what we would see in the op report i took an example practice op report and I divided it up into sections. So normally it's all on one page, but I wanted you to know that there are some standards out there. The JC uh, AHO is one and the AAAHS. It's not particularly important that you know who or you know know that much about them, but there is a standard that says this is everything that needs to be in an op report. Okay. Um, and you can even go out to those websites and they'll probably have examples for you. So if you look over on the left, that's, again, mostly what we already went over. And the beginning is at the top, you're going to see, and this is all redacted. This is all, you know, uh, not a real person or place. You have where the procedure's being done at, the patient's name, and then you would also have, you know, the date of service, date, uh, birth date, as well as uh, the patient's medical record number, most likely. 
would all be in one little area, usually at the top, upper left-hand corner. Uh, and then what are we going to have? We're going to have the pre-op and the post-op diagnosis. Uh, and sometimes they'll go ahead and they'll list the procedure that was done. Notice on this one, they provided a CPT code. That's done more than it used to be because it was our job to pull the codes, the diagnosis and the CPT codes. But now that EMRs are being used and they're kind of filling in the blanks, they can go in and they can grab these and preload these codes. But of course, you audit them to make sure that, you know, because a few words could change and they could be picking the wrong code. Who the surgeon was, was there an assistant? Okay, so that's another portion that would be next. Then we're gonna know who's the anesthesiologist, uh, and what type of anesthesia was used, and uh, who did the report. So we know Dr. Good is doing this report, and Dr. Smith is the anesthesiologist. Again, this was all one giant body now, and I divided it up into sections uh, so that it would make it easier for you to look at. Now, we're not going to read all of this because everybody that's in the club can go in and read this at their leisure. Indications. What is what is the information about the patient? We've got a 65-year-old female. Okay. What's wrong? What what are we treating? And it's redundant eyelid skin with puffiness, et cetera. They're going to do a surgical correction. So now when we looked at the previous page, we knew they were doing to do like a blepharoplasty, right? They're going to, they, and this is something that they do when the eyelid, especially if you've got hooded eyes, but as we age, the elasticity uh, is not as strong in those skin and that delicate skin there will, will cover the eyes to where they really have difficulty seeing. So, what are we abstracting out of this first portion of the the body of the op report? She has redundant eyelid skin, and they're going to surgically correct it. Yes, is that the the procedure that was being done? That's at the top. Yes, it's a match. So nothing extra is being done there. What type of anesthesia was there? Well. We knew we were going to, it was listed at the top. So if it was going to be general anesthesia, et cetera, et cetera, that would all be there. But, and now we're just verifying, yes, that, that they did have anesthesia. And notice that uh, they'll always have an IV placed. A lot of times the anesthesiologist will place the IV before you go in because they're the one that's going to maintain it and put the drugs in it for you, right? Not only are they keeping your fluid up, but they're, passing drugs through there. So again, the anesthesia section is usually next, talking about them anesthetizing the patient. And then there's always a section that talks about the prep. Now, here I didn't highlight anything because all of this is fodder. We already know they're working on the eyes. We know they're anesthetizing them. None of this here is important to a coder for the most part. So again, that's a lot of content that we just skip over. We don't need it. Now, you wouldn't know that if you didn't understand the layout of the op report and the verbiage that you're looking for. So continuing with now the body, the actual procedure's been started. And again, we know it's a blepharoplasty and we don't really care uh, this particular procedure there's not a lot that we need to know now there's other procedures that we do for example if we had had a cholecystectomy that started out as you know uh, laparoscopic and then they did they opened them up and did an open cholecystectomy versus a laparoscopic this is where it's going to be noted is in the body of you know and that's pertinent you would be abstracting that but for the most part blepharoplasty pretty easy and the reason I picked this is because I didn't want to use you know 20 slides dividing all of this up I wanted to pick something that you could just kind of get a feel for it now I did highlight uh, the closure on here noticed that what type of thread is used 
the reason I make a point to tell you that is because with some procedures, not necessarily ops that they go in and they put them under, think of um, Dr. Sandra Lee and she takes off those lipomas or she removes cysts and stuff like that. If they have to um, repair the closure, then it's and if it's more complicated than the actual removal of whatever they were doing, you know, then you're going to be ha you will have to code for uh, a simple, intermediate, or complex closure. How will you know to find that information? It'll be right there in the body, and it'll be the closure part. This one says that they use interrupted seven uh, through O. Uh, propylene sutures and propylene sutures are there's sutures that have to be removed there's uh, sutures that will dissolve and this is verbiage you would want to understand if this is sutures propylene are the type that are um, they don't dissolve they need to be removed and so we know that it's a single layer closure but if it was a uh, a closure that was intermediate or complex, you're going to see multiple types of sutures listed, different names and different sizes. And they will say things like layered closure, uh, debriding the edges, and so on and so forth. So the closure is very, very important. And it's usually, you know, at the, uh, again, at the end of the body is where that's listed. And then is there any complications? Was there any complications? They wrap up and the patient had good vision, was able to see after the procedure was done. They had uh, no hematomas. The hemostasis was, that just is a fancy word for saying everything was working well afterwards. And then you notice in that last section before the signature, it says with, it was completed without complications. If there was a complication during the procedure, that means the codes are going to change. You'll notice when you go look at the codes that there will be, you know, with a complication, you know, and then we may have to code the complication. And of course, we're going to have our signature down at the end, and it'll usually be an e-signature, and there's acceptable formats for e-signatures, you know, uh, so make sure you know the difference from them just going in and looking and them actually signing off on the document. And that's it. That's everything. Now we had a question. Uh, Nancy says, uh, let's see, what was the site for the live op? OR live, operating room, orlive.com or maybe or.com live.com or it may just be or.live. I can't remember. It's been a while. Uh, but you can go in easily and find YouTube videos. They usually have a note saying, you know, graphic content. Um, I was at one today when I was doing research and uh, it was on the website and then it had a video that was linked to it. And so I was able to watch part of the procedure being done. It was a real short segment. So again, and that was a teaching facility. Uh, uh, I don't think Mayo Clinic and WebMD is not going to have those are those are websites that are geared for education to the patient usually. So you're looking for provider education where they're you know the the clinicians are being trained, and that's going to give you videos. Uh, you can go in and look uh, just Google cholecystectomy or go to YouTube and put in cholecystectomy and you'll probably get some animated videos as well as find a few live uh, videos. Easy. All right, we have more questions. Thank you for the happy birthdays. I appreciate that, guys, because um, I enjoy my birthday very, very much. Thus, I have, uh, I usually always wear a tiara all day long. And if I had a boa, a feather boa, I would have worn that too all day. Uh, let's see. I'm an auditor, Nancy says, uh, for a payer, and this really helps. It, and that's right, because it's not just the coder and the biller, but the auditor for an insurance company. Uh, if you are in that arena and you need to go back and check and see what's being um, 
documented if you know what's supposed to be there then you can see if errors are up or even help with cdi uh, suggestions and things so again we we have other people that are in the club that are uh, work for the the payers as well and and auditors uh debbie let's see Oh, I want to learn PCS. Absolutely. We have plenty of education on PCS. We have a course that will help you with inpatient coding. You can get your CCS or your CIC and just go to, you know, cco.us and you can see the courses. And uh, we have several excellent PCS um, courses. I love PCS. I think it's going to replace CPT. Oh, physical therapy and occupational therapy. Those are good areas. Mm, excellent. E&M is changing in 2021, so um, that's an that's going to be something you want to work on. Okay, more operative reports. Okay, so if if you want more operative reports like this, we can do it. Uh, uh, in fact, if there's a particular procedure or op that you would like to go through, like we can do interventional radiology, we uh, can uh, do, uh, you know, <laughs> we can do just about anything. I I don't want to really get into heavy op reports like transplants and stuff. That's that is multiple teams, multiple providers, and that would just take forever. But if you wanted uh, highlights of something like that, you know, we could do that. But uh, absolutely, we we will go through those. Um, let's see. Suggestions for getting into general surgery. Uh, though, out, uh, you can, you could, um, Surgery centers is where I would look. That's that's where I would think uh, will be your goal place. Most of those are all associated with a hospital, though. They're connected to the hospital. Sometimes there will be provider groups that, that do that ancillary surgery centers. But that's what it would be ASC for ancillary surgery center. Uh, start looking at those and, and finding out those in the area that are looking for coders. Uh, they like COCs, you know, that outpatient. Um, they Any training that's involved there will help you. Let's see, will a quiz for the webinar be available for the Replay Club? Uh, yes, it will. Now, we, Susan, we do our CEUs a little bit different. Uh, we are combining them more so that this wouldn't be just one CEU because it was one hour. We may combine it with similar so you can watch like three and get three CEUs at a time or five. Uh, uh, or there may be some that are individual one CEUs. But yes, it will take a little bit uh, to get the one for this one, though, because there's a delay. Uh, if we're going through the AAPC, uh, of course, they're delayed. But sometimes getting CEU approval right now is... is um, time consuming. So it could be several weeks before the CEU is connected to this particular video. So we, uh, we have to write the CEU questions. It has to be transcribed. Uh, so we make a, a package deal and then it's um, submitted. And then we have to wait, you know, several weeks for them to come back and tell us and, and give us the CEU number and things. So be patient with us. Uh, uh, we tend to be able to get our part done pretty quickly, but again, we're uh, the um, credentialing organization doesn't always move as fast as we do. So, right. Thank you guys very much. I think we did good. If we don't have any more questions, I will um, finish my coconut birthday cake and finish my ice. This is actually iced tea. And I'll wear my pretty little tiara on the way out. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Alicia. Happy birthday to you. Thank you, Boyd. I love my birthdays. And my husband's was um, the fifth. So we always usually celebrate the same time. We have a wonderful time celebrating. So thank you guys. Thank you, Maureen.
Oh, sinus surgery is okay. ENT. We'll do that next. Maureen, I'll put that down on the list. And tell your friends. Let them know that uh, we're available to help them as well. And check out the club if you're not already in there. And we can have more discussions. Let us know in the club too if there's a particular area. But I'll make a note. ENT, sinus surgeries, uh, terminate septos, things like that. Yeah. In fact, uh, where I got this one, there was one uh, uh, fixing a deviated septum. So maybe I'll grab that, that one for next time. Okay. You got at least 60 oh, happy birthdays. I'm counting roughly. So just FYI. Go check your comments because after this is done. I will. I will. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I think that's all, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And yeah. we'll see you next time. We've got another one on Thursday, I believe. We don't have a topic yeah, yet. Yeah, it's a student webinar. Student, uh, oh, yeah. I, I can't remember what if I picked the topic yet, but I think we, we're either going to uh, – we may be doing something on risk adjustment because we've been having a lot of questions come in for risk adjustment and um, – higher specificity for risk adjustment on some other things. So gotcha. Will I'll that maybe. Perfect. Ooh. Okay. Cardio surgery implant defibrillator. Very good, Joan for that's a great one. Okay. That's a good one. <laughs> All right. Goodbye everybody. Have a great evening. Bye.